Let's pray. The Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. We thank you so much for what you have done through our lives, how faithful you are, and you always keep your promises. And we thank you so much for healing that you provide us. Uh, we thank you so much for your presence. We thank you so much for being with us everywhere we go, that we may be able to speak the truth over the lives of the people, Father. And this time, we want to also hear your truth. Would you open our hearts widely and give us willing ears? And not only that we may be the healers of your word, but also be the doers of your word, Father. Because when we keep your promises, when we do your promises, and when we obey your word, that your word is activated in our life, in daily life, so your presence becomes so real, not only in our personal life, but also the people surrounding us may be able to witness your presence, your power, and also your mercy, Lord. Would you anoint my tongue with your Holy Spirit and help me to speak words that are only pleasing to you. And we thank you and we honor you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Hypothetically, if there is a particular sister recently joining our ministry, and she's in early 20th, and hypothetically, and there is a brother, a single brother, in his early 50, and he's a multimillionaire, and it happens to be uh, this sister who lost her husband recently, and is beginning to entice this older gentleman who is a multi-millionaire. And they end up getting married quickly within a few months. How would you interpret this? How would you interpret this occasion? Would you be able to say, oh, this is by the grace of God. This is orchestration of God's divine appointment. So let's uh, celebrate and we congratulate you or we bless you, so forth. Or would you consider as uh, one of the scandals that you can see from Hollywood magazines that you go to market places? I don't know even those names. You see, you know, all these uh, uh, young women marrying multi-millionaires or billionaires or old men and so forth. How would you interpret this? As a Christian, if it happens in our ministry, I don't know if I myself will have a hard time interpreting this, and I don't know if I will be able to truly, wholeheartedly bless this couple. Uh, but there's a similar story from the scriptures. Uh, it actually happened. A very young widow, her name was Ruth, and will come to a ministry called the Bethlehem and finds a multimillionaire old gentleman. Probably he was a single until then, and they ended up getting married. But it seems like a people in Bethlehem celebrates and bless them. Why? Because everything has been orchestrated along with the law of God. God's word had been fulfilled in their lives. So tonight, as we go through the Bible time, and I know that we have entered into 1 Samuel, but we want to go back to the story of Ruth, that we want to learn from this story how God blesses such people when these people relinquished their rights and fully entrusted their life upon the Lord, and God begins to bless Everyone, except those people who are alive, in the story continually. So to summarize it, to conclude this story, the story of Ruth is a story of rel relinquishment. Those people who relinquished their rights and fully entrusted upon God, and God began to honor them, and God began to bless them. So let's turn our Bible to Book of Ruth and, and examine each one's life, particularly life of Ruth and life of Naomi and also life of Boaz. 
and let's look at their lives and how they surrender their rights, they relinquish their rights, and fully entrust upon the Lord, and God begins to bless them. And this is a, such a beautiful story in the midst of such dark time, at the time of Judges. So let's uh, turn our Bible to Book of Ruth, uh, starting with uh, chapter 1, from verse 1. Uh, up to verse 6, let us alternate. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to Sazon in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. There was a particular family in the city of Bethlehem of Judah. And the man's name was Elimelech, and this means God is my king. And the story of Judges, as we know, the repeatedly it's been mentioned in the book of Judges because there was no king, people did whatever seems to be right to their eyes. But there's a man, Elimelech, and he names himself as God is my king. So we can see immediately he is a godly man. And Naomi, is, her name means a sweetness. And also, um, their sons, Malon, means a sickly. So probably Malon was a physically very ailing and very weak. And Chilion is, means a consuming. Uh, probably this the boy was very demanding or so forth. It means uh, wasting away and, and so forth. And there was a famine in the land. And I, as we have read book of Judges, multiple times God will judge his people with the famines. Or there was a particular record during the time of uh, Gideon. There was a great famine because of Midianites and so forth. So we can understand repeatedly in the time of judges, because they began to worship idols, God will judge his people with the famines or enslavement by their enemies and so forth. So when the famine happened in Bethlehem, we don't know exactly who the judge was at the time or even at the time of famine, there was no judge. And because of famine and difficulties arose that Elimelech decided to take his family to Moabite's land. Now, as we know, by God's word, by the law of God, that God will not allow um, even Moabites to enter into the congregation of Israelites. And when we look at book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23, verse 3 through 6, this was judgment casted upon the people of Moab. Why? Because when the people of Israel wanted to go through Moabites' land to enter into the promised land, they prohibited. So instead, the Moabite king hired Balaam to curse these people. And because of this sin, God cast a judgment upon these people. So let's look at book of Deuteronomy chapter 20. Three, how God put a judgment upon these people. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Because they met you not with the bread and with the water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt. And because they hired against the Balaam, the son of Bor of Pathor, of Mesopotamia to curse thee. 
Nevertheless, that the Lord of thy God will not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord of thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because of the Lord of thy God loved thee. And thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all thy days forever. So Israelites were prohibited to enter into the land of Moabites, and also Moabites are not allowed into in, enter into the congregation of God's people. So Jewish people were not allowed to seek for prosperity from Moabites. However, Elimelech, even though he may have been godly person, because of famine, he was looking for a better place to dwell in. So they decided to go to Moabite's land. And that was against God's will. So something that we must understand in our life, because there is a certain place and certain ministry, even church or city, that God wants us to dwell. But, you know, when we live in that land, not only that sometimes we enjoy prosperity and blessings and happiness and so, so forth, life is a mixture of happiness and difficult times. Even Jesus declared that you will have a tribulation in your life. But just because a tribulation happens, just because a famine happens in our life, it can be in our marriage, in our relationships, in our place, even in our workplaces. Just because of famine, we should not move. We need to be led by the Spirit, not by the circumstances. And we saw this with the life of Abraham. God commanded him to go to the land of Canaan. And immediately when he reached there, the famine happened. So because of famine, he decided to go down to the Egypt. And he was humiliated in the land of Egypt. And by God's grace and mercy, even though uh, numerous mistakes and wrong decisions we make, at the end, by God's grace and mercy, God will turn that occasion and mistake and bring them up. And as he was returning back to the land of promise, God gave him more prosperity, gaining from Egypt. And he had many, many livestock. Uh, because of that, he ended up bringing Hagar as well, Egyptian slave. And through Hagar, we know Ismael happened and continually, generation after generation, because of descendants of Ismael, that Israel will have a thorn on the side. And Isaac also fell into the same temptation. When famine happened in the land of Canaan, he decided to go to the land of Philistine, and he also was a humiliated there as well. And as we can see, the family of Elimelech, Elimelech, because he ignored God's word and decided because of famine and led by the circumstances, not by the spirit, not by God's word, ended up living in Moab. He desired the prosperity. He desired better life. He desired the happiness in Moab. But he ended up dying there. And Naomi also lost her two sons there within 10 years. So she's left with two more widows. Herself is a widow, and there are two more widows. And then there is news from the land of Bethlehem that God revisited the people, and God began to bless them. And with this news... Naomi decides to return back to the land of promise where she should have been belonged in the first place. Now, as she's moving forward, I don't know, we don't know clearly whether Naomi understood God's word because she cannot bring Moabite's women. Why? Because God clearly said Moabites cannot enter into the congregation of the Lord's tenth generation, even forever. I don't, we don't know because it's not written clearly. We don't know. Naomi understood that or not. But probably by the life's circumstance, because she lost everything. She doesn't have a husband. She doesn't have sons. She probably, they probably mortgaged the, the land in Bethlehem. It seems like later on as she confessed, I went out in full, but I have returned back. 
with their empty hands. So probably they were well prospered, but now she got nothing. She has absolutely zero to offer to these daughters-in-law. So that was just a burden to her. And she cannot be responsible for their lives. So she says, why don't you go back to your land? So let's continue on with this story. Let's read the book of Ruth, chapter 1, from verses 6 through 18, and let us alternate. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return Ichi to her mother's house, and the Lord deal kindly with you, and you have dealt with the dead and with me. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have a hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons. And they lift up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goes, I will go, and where thou lodges, I will lodge, and thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And verse 18 altogether. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. And this is a very beautiful occasion how Ruth, knowing Naomi has lost everything. She doesn't have a husband. She doesn't have two sons. She doesn't have a land. And there's no guarantee of the future. But Ruth decides to follow her. And there's one thing that she can see, because we don't know the full story in detail, but Naomi is a godly woman. So in Moab, she probably talked about God of Israel repeatedly. So Ruth ended up believing God of Israel as an ultimately true living God. And by, we receive a faith by hearing and hearing word of God. And Ruth gained the faith in God of Israel. So she decides to follow Naomi. Now, when we look at Orpah, it's very understandable. It's very reasonable. There's no guarantee if she follows to Bethlehem. And the future is very gloomy. So she decides to go back to her family. And no one can condemn her. And it's quite understandable. But Ruth decides to relinquish all her rights and entrust upon her. And she decides to honor God. She decides to invite the God of Israel as her own God and decides to follow Naomi. Upon this, there is something that we can learn from Ruth. When we decide to follow God, that we should not expect anything from the people. She decides to expect nothing from Naomi. She knows Naomi has nothing to give, nothing to offer to her. But she understands God of Israel with a, is with Naomi. And upon God, she relinquishes all her rights and decides to follow 
her until the end. And that determination is when you die, as you bury your body, that's where I'm going to bury my body. That kind of determination, that kind of commitment is so sure that in today's culture, it's rarely we'll be able to find such determination, such commitment to God or even to a person. You don't need to give me anything. You don't need to promise me anything. You don't need to guarantee any me. I'm not demanding you to give me anything because I decide to follow you. But I am following your God because he will be my God. So don't worry about trying to take care of me, trying to offer me anything, trying to promise anything to me. Because I trust God. God is my savior. God is my provider. God is my protector. So you don't need to be responsible over my life. Because I relinquish all my rights. I can go back to my father's house. And I can stay with my people. And I can stay with my country, Moab. But I decide to trust God and him alone. And I relinquish all my rights and follow your God, so you don't have to worry about being responsible over my life. So when we decide to worship God, when we decide to follow God, and when we decide to serve God, it's very important that we do not expect anything from the people. It's very important because when we decide to when we expect something from the human source, and when that is not meeting our expectation, and we will be offended, and we will stumble. Because when we have a sense of entitlement, because I'm serving this church, because I'm serving the body this way, because I'm giving my time, my money, and my talents, and my efforts this way, and church is responsible to provide me and repay me in certain ways, and the people will always fail you. People will always fail your expectation. And then you will stumble and then you will be offended. But our mode is that I am not expecting anything from the people, from human. Because a human fails and human is imperfect just like you and I. But I entrust God. I expect God. Because I decide to honor him and I decide to serve him. And he will repay me with whatever that I serve him. In the end, what do we deserve? We deserve hell. If anything that is entitled of us is hell because of our sin. So there is nothing that we can be entitled of. I feel, have a sense of entitlement because I do this, good deeds, and so forth. How can we be able to compensate all the sins and all the iniquities that we commit before God and before the people with our good deeds, with our service? Absolutely not. Because we are indebted forever when we are indebted with a over billion dollars debt. And even though with our good deeds and with our service, with our volunteering and with our worship, may be able to pay off $1,000, but there's no way, absolutely no way that we can fully repay our debt that we owe to our God. Because at bottom line, we are entitled to go to hell. But God has rescued us, God has delivered us, and God has saved us. And even this service, giving us opportunity to serve him and worship him and do his ministry, even in preaching the gospel, it's all by the grace of God. I'm one unworthy servant, and I deserve utter damnation, but you have delivered me from the punishment of hell, and you have given me eternal life, and by your grace, I am saved, and I am forever indebted to you, and whatever service I do to you, it is out of my gratitude, and only you I trust, only you I trust, and with that mentality, with that attitude, as we continually follow, and when we decide to follow God and Jesus, 
We follow him until the end. Until the end. And then later on, as we know, because she has relinquished her right, there's a beautiful declaration from um, Boaz that Boaz comes and recognizes her and he commands her uh, how she has relinquished her right and came to the land of Bethlehem. So and when we look at book of Ruth, chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, as we know the story, as Ruth was gleaning in the field and happened to be this field that belonged to Boaz. And Boaz, later on, we know he was a near kinsman redeemer to Naomi. And this is Boaz, what he says, because he already heard news about uh, Ruth and her good deeds. And this is what Boaz says in Ruth 2, uh, verse 11 and 12, Boaz answered and said unto her, It has fully been showed to me all thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and I'll come unto a people which thou knowest not hereof. And the Lord will recompensate thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. And as we know, Boaz is, is able to recognize the good deeds and the determination Ruth has offered. And later on, uh, we know the story, Ruth has uh, uh, go in uh, to the feet of Boaz, and Boaz recognized it's Ruth, and then Boaz uh, 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 finally marries her, and so forth. But let's look at Boaz. You know Boaz's mother? Boaz's mother was Rahab. In the book of Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, this is what, uh, in Jesus' genealogy, uh, Boaz is mentioned and also his father. Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. Uh, we don't know exactly whether Boaz was already married and he had a wife or not, but we can speculate that he was without wife until even though he was very old. He was much, much older. We don't know how many older, probably at least 20 or 30 years older than Ruth because Boaz says to Ruth, my daughter, the older man, older woman calls younger woman my daughter, at least 20 or 30 years younger than Boaz. And we can speculate Boaz was a still bachelor. How? Because his ancestry, his mother was a Ruth. His mother was also Gentile, but his mother was a prostitute. Even, we don't know the story because the Bible doesn't reveal us how Rahab ended up marrying Solomon. And there are many, many speculations from scholars and commentaries and, and so forth. Solomon was probably one of the two spies who went, went into the land of Canaan where Rahab rescued them and so forth. And that's how they fell in love with each other and so forth. That's a very American way of interpretation, how they fell in love with each other and so forth. But they got married. Solomon was one of the tribe's leader, and they ended up getting married. Even though they are married, because of Rahab believed in the God of Israel, but she is from prostitution. And the boy who is born out of mother who is a prostitute, then all the people surrounding his life probably knew his mother was a prostitute and also Gentile. Then, that we can assume he might have been socially ostracized by Jewish people. Because you are not supposed to not only marry Gentile woman, but also prostitute. And that's why perhaps 
he was not able to get married with a Jewish, proper Jewish woman. We don't know exactly, but there's a high probability. But the way Boaz is able to understand the condition of Ruth is because he knows how to be a Gentile. Because he understood his mother's life, being a prostitute, being a Gentile woman, living in a Jewish land. Because that he also suffered, because he went through the difficulties in life, he's able to understand the difficulties of the lives of other people. The sufferings that God allows in our life is for the sake of consolation for other people. And Apostle Paul talks about it in the Second Corinthians chapter 1. And so let's look at Second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 5. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abound by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. The reason why, one of the reasons why God allows us sufferings and betrayals and calamity in our life is because when we go through the suffering, there is a consolation from Jesus Christ. There is a comfort of God coming to us. And with the comfort that we experience through our suffering, that we can be the comfort for other people. If I never experienced the poverty, if I never experienced the Betrayal. I never experienced the suffering and failures. Then as a leader, I will never be able to minister those people who go through the sufferings. One of the reasons why that I understand those people who are demonized, those people who suffer with the demons, is because I myself have experienced tremendous spiritual operation, demonic operation myself, and that's why I can understand what kind of suffering they go through. Because I have failed in my ministry, that I can comfort those pastors who go through the failures. Because I've been betrayed by the people, that I can minister those people who've been betrayed. Because I got married so late when I was 39 years old that I can understand single brothers and sisters when they wrestle, when they patiently wait for God's divine time. Otherwise, how can you understand me? It'll be just like a hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Because Boaz also came from the mixture of Jewish blood and Gentile blood, when he saw Ruth, that he can have extraordinary compassion for this woman, even though she is much younger, that she can understand how it is like living in the foreign land as a Gentile woman, and especially she's being widowed, because she, he saw the life of his mother being a Gentile and prostitute, and how she was ostracized. By the society. She, he knows how to be lonely. He knows how, that, how you can feel when your entire society rejects you and avoids you. And because of that, the boys is able to bring Ruth under his arm. So whenever we go through the sufferings and trials... And our attitude, instead of choosing to become bitter, and when we decide to be thankful, right there, there's always a lesson. And God will use that suffering to bless other people, to become their comfort, to become their encouragement later. I was talking with uh, uh, some of the church members recently about financial difficulties, and as they were going through uh, such a severe financial difficulties, and they mentioned about certain event that happened to their lives, and I tried to encourage them, and they told me, Pastor Sean, have you experienced this much of financial difficulties? I mean, I experienced the poverty. Yes, I understand. There were many days that 
I was wondering tomorrow morning if I had uh, money to put a gas in my car that I would be able to come to the church and I couldn't share with anyone and I would just only rely upon God. And to that degree that I had uh, suffered financial difficulties, but not to their degree. So they said, Pastor Shan, you cannot come for us because you never experienced it. And I told them, yes, you're right. I cannot comfort you because I don't know exactly what you are going through. And I had to be honest. I had to be honest. But when the suffering becomes such a sweetness to the lives of other people, when ourselves, when we go through the sufferings, the consolation of Jesus Christ abound us. And we experience it and we overcome it by the grace of God. And then, without us knowing, later God will use us to be the comforts for those people who also go through the sufferings in their lives. And because Boaz had a similar life circumstance and situation and understood exactly how Ruth will feel, that Boaz had extra compassion for such woman and such a weak person and lowest a person and we can have a genuine compassion for them and Naomi is also a woman who has relinquished her right why because by the Levitical law she had a right to marry next to kinsman because the law says, let's read it uh, briefly. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25, verse 5 through 10, but let's read the first few verses, what the law says. If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of her husband's brother unto her. So Naomi lost her husband. So whomever the next kin may be, we don't know in the chapter 4, there was immediate kinsman who relinquished his right to Boaz so that Boaz may marry Ruth. But Naomi has a right to demand to kinsman to marry me because I lost my, my husband. So you are the next kin. So marry me so that through my womb, there may be son and there may be name of my husband continually sustained in the nation of Israel. But because she loves Ruth, because she, she wants to repay the favor and grace that Ruth has done for her, for this old widow who was not able to offer anything to Ruth, though, so she relinquished her right to marry next kin to Ruth. So Ruth ends up marrying Boaz. And Boaz also relinquishes his right. Probably as an older gentleman and this young and beautiful woman, I don't, we don't know how beautiful she was. She probably was because that's why he's, he said to her, I told the young man not to touch her so that she was attractive and maybe drew attention from the young man. But until then, she, he also has right to marry young men, young women with a, his wealth. I need to be careful with my words, especially in today's culture. <laughs> but he relinquishes his right with a, his wealth. And also, he can be manipulative. If he desires to marry Ruth, and maybe he just twists the situation so that he may bypass the close the kin so that he ends up marrying Ruth. But he does it properly, honoring God and fearing God and honoring God's word. To end the story of Ruth, this is a beautiful story of those people who relinquished their rights and entrusted upon God, and God begins to honor them. And especially Ruth, when she decides to follow Naomi, 
and God of Israel and God of Naomi. There is absolutely no guarantee for the future. There is absolutely nothing Naomi can offer to her. But fully she trusts God. And she relinquishes all her right. And she doesn't have any expectation from the circumstances, from the people. But she fully relies upon God. And she begins to follow him and worship him and serve him. And God repays her with a husband, with a wealth, and even spiritual blessings that she is included ancestry genealogy of Jesus Christ. In the God's divine plan of salvation, her name is included because she chose to grab God and him alone. And when we decide to, decide to possess in God alone nothing else, then we can possess everything in this world as well. And God is not mocked. And when our hearts are divided and two-minded, that we cannot possess anything, as James says. But when we surrender everything and let go of all our rights and take up the cross, then Jesus begins to honor us. That's life of taking up the cross. Relinquishing our right and taking up our responsibility. And in our own lives, we need to relinquish our own rights. Even in the company, in the family, with our titles, with our position. You know, I don't know how many times that I need to remind them myself that I need to relinquish right of being a pastor and get rid of this title and to serve our people. Otherwise, I can be also stumbling all the time. I say to first-generation Korean pastors, to serve a second-generation Korean Americans, you need to relinquish your right of being a pastor. Otherwise, it's impossible with a second generation. Because with a first generation, the Korean Christians, they expect their pastor to be their pastor. To me, second-generation Korean Americans and English-speaking Christians, they expect their pastor to be their friend. But sometimes I'm Agura too. Because I grew up in the KM side, serving first generation, absolute submission, obedience, and total respect and honoring the spiritual authorities. So I do that to my leaders, and I've been serving that way. But when I come to EM, it doesn't work that way. And if I expect the same attitude, then I'll be stumbled all the time. All the time. So I need to re remind myself, I'm not 